Well, welcome to all of you guys that are joining us from all of our campuses, those of you at Northgate and at Madras, and those of you joining us online. We're really glad that you're here joining us for this series. We started this uh, series last week, and we're going to lead right on up to Easter, looking at snapshots of Jesus. And what we're doing is we're looking at the story of Jesus' death and resurrection, but we're doing it in a way that's uh, well, probably a little different than what you'd expect. Instead of us looking at uh, pictures of Jesus from the perspective of the major characters, what you might consider primary characters in the story, we're looking at what most people would consider uh, minor characters and how they saw the events that went on. But here's the thing what we're learning is, even though you might call these minor characters, they really did play a major role in what happened in this, uh, in this period of Jesus' life leading right up uh, to his death and resurrection. Another thing we learned, we started talking about this last week, was that all of these characters we're looking at, well, they have something in common, and, and here it is. Everybody in the story we're looking at, in some way or another, they all resisted God and what he was doing. And if you're like me, and you approach the scriptures, and you, you, you're convinced that Jesus is God in the flesh, that he died and rose again from the dead, if you're like me, you, you want to look at these characters, and you, and you want to say, how in the world does that happen? I mean... You were in the presence of Jesus. You were there. I mean, God himself in the flesh, and you still resisted God? I mean, when I think about it, I think to myself, man, if I was there, if I had experienced what they did and saw what they saw and heard what they heard, I would have never resisted God. I, and you look at them and you think, even now, you know, you're with him, and you still are holding on to your own agenda, and you're still trying to, you know, the whole thing, you just didn't get it. But here's the thing I'm learning. The more I look at these characters and the more I learn about these stories is, I'm learning that I have a lot more in common with these characters than I think I do. And I may not be quite as special as I think I am. And th the other thing we're learning, and I think this is even the most ironic part of this whole series we're looking at, is all of these people who in some way resisted God, said no to what was going on, and tried to sort of force their own agenda, every single one who resisted his, his, his plan or ha had his own idea of how things ought to go, when they tried to stand up and prove that they were in control of the situation, they actually, through their story, proved the exact opposite. They, they proved through their story that all along, no, God was really in control. And nothing they did, nothing they didn't do, could actually thwart his plan. There's nothing that they, they could do to stop what God was, was, was doing in this time. Now, the person that we're going to be learning about, looking at today, we're going to see the Jesus story through his eyes, you're going to know him immediately as soon as I tell you his name. In fact, you don't have to be a Bible person to recognize this guy in this story. Um, now, it's not because you have heard his name uh, because somebody you know is named after. In fact, I think it's ironic. You know, a lot of people like to name their kids after Bible characters, and you probably know some people named Matthew or Luke or Paul or John or even, you know, Isaiah or Jacob. You, you know somebody with that name. I guarantee you, you don't know anybody with the name of the character we're looking at today because nobody names their kid after this guy. Today, we're talking about Judas. And see, even when I say his name, immediately you have some thoughts. Probably the first thought you had was villain. You know, that's the bad guy. He's, he's, the, he's the villain of the story. Because as soon as you hear his name, that's what you think about. In fact, in our day, uh, the name Judas, is we've actually turned it into an insult. I mean, if you ever call somebody a Judas, man, everybody knows what that means. You know, there's a guy who'll stab you in the back. <laughs> there's a guy who will betray you who you can't trust. It, it, Judas, it, it, he was. He was the betrayer. He was the one who suddenly decided to switch sides. He went from being on Jesus' side to joining with his enemies and the ones who were actually after Jesus to kill him. But at the same time, Judas was one of the inner circle. He was right there. I mean, there was nobody in the story that got more access and closer to Jesus than Judas and the guys surrounding him. Judas was, wasn't just one of these people hanging around the fringes. He was part of the group. He was a, in fact, he was really highly trusted. He was one of the most highly trusted followers of Jesus. And the reason we can say that and the reason we kind of can infer that from the story is because Judas was given the job of taking care of the money. In fact, he was sort of like the treasurer among the first followers, early disciples of Jesus. And, and my point is this. You don't give that job to somebody that you don't trust. I mean, you only give that job to somebody who you feel like you can sort of put your, your faith in. And, and I say all that to make this point. Judas's story doesn't start where it ends. 
the guy that Judah started out being is not the guy he ended up being. And it's important for you to understand that. But see, the one fatal flaw that, that finally did Judas in, because he wasn't like this all along, but I think the one fatal flaw that finally did it, did it for him was, well, Judas was, was only in it for himself. That was, that was sort of true for him by the time he got to the end. He, he wasn't there for Jesus or some sense of loyalty to Jesus. G- Judas believed, first of all, Judas started out being a great guy. He, he believed Jesus was the king. He believed Jesus was Messiah, that he was the one that had been foretold for generations, that God was going to send to set the Jewish people free. Judas believed that if, if anybody can get close to Jesus, they're going to be in on what this great new kingdom that Jesus was going to be ushering in, and, and they'd be sort of in the winter circle at the end of the day. Now, let's be a little bit fair to Judas because... In truth, that's what the, all the disciples thought in the beginning. You know, I mean, they all believed that. They were they were kind of all in it for what they could get out of it in the very beginning. I mean, they saw that their following Jesus, that was their way to, to get something out of it for themselves. I, I'll give you a few examples. First one is Peter, one of Jesus' uh, closest followers. Again, he he typically speaks up for the whole group. He does that a lot in the, in the stories of Jesus. And, and look at what he says one time, uh, Matthew ne- chapter 19. He says, Look, Jesus, we've given up everything to follow you. Now, tell us, what's in it for us? What are we going to get? I don't know about you. I think that's a pretty bold question to be asking. Now, there's another time you read the story of Jesus, and they're all kind of walking together. They're traveling, and Jesus overhears. They're having a conversation back there, so he sort of listens in, and he, he realizes they're, they're arguing about something. And so he listens to see what they're arguing about, and they're not having an argument about what you'd hope they'd have an argument about, about, you know, who gets to heal the next sick person. They don't care about that. They're, they're having this argument about who's going to get the best job when Jesus takes over, when he becomes king and rules. They want to know who's going to be Jesus' right-hand man and, and essentially what the argument is, which one of us in the inner circle, which one is the greatest? You know, I'm the greatest. No, I'm the greatest. And, and they're having this argument. And Again, it just illustrates that even the disciples, all of them in the beginning, they were in it for what they were going to get out of it. They, they, that was their motivation. I mean, they wanted to know who was going to be in when Jesus became king. So Judas is not the only disciple who starts out being in it for himself. But here's the difference. Eventually, eventually, all the other disciples, the original followers of Jesus, were able to finally lay down their agendas. They were eventually able to lay down even their own lives and their livelihoods to follow Jesus. And all of them would eventually come to the place where they could finally say, okay, Jesus, this, this is probably not going to turn out like I had thought it was going to turn out, but you know what? I trust you. And, and even if there's nothing in it for me, even if, if what I'd hoped to get out of it doesn't happen the way I had hoped, Jesus, this is not about me anymore. I, I'm following you, and, and wherever you take me, I'm okay with that because I just trust you. All the, dis- the disciples came to that place at some point except for Judas. See, for Judas, it never changed. It was always what's in it for me. He, he was always looking for the angle. In fact, actually, what he was doing was he was, he was sort of playing a, a little game of bartering with God, almost a bargaining with God. In fact, we talked about this several months ago. You know, what can I get, do to get the most out of this Jesus situation? How can I manipulate? How can I bargain with Jesus in order to get him to do what I really want him to do? And eventually Judas just came to realize Jesus wouldn't play in by those rules. And it's not at all how Jesus operated. See, here's some things that Judas understood. He knew that in order for him to get Jesus to to be the kind of king that he thought Jesus ought to be, first of all, he knew Jesus had to get rid of the Romans because, see, in that time, the Romans were in charge. They were were the ruling authorities. And so Judas understood if if we're going to take over, if we're going to rule, we've got to get rid of these, these Romans. One problem, Jesus never seemed to quite hate the Romans as much as Judas did. In fact, there were some instances that Judas started believing that maybe Jesus actually loved them, and that didn't make sense, and, and that wouldn't fit into Judas's agenda. Another thing that he saw was that, you know, if you're going to be a king, you've you got to draw a crowd. You've got to get a lot of people on your team, and now make no mistake, Jesus could do that. Jesus drew lots of crowds. I mean, he could draw a crowd in a heartbeat, but then Jesus would do odd things like, he would send the crowds away, or he'd go off and, and, and be by himself, and he'd actually hide from the crowds. And then there would be times when he'd just start saying things that just, it didn't make sense. And the people in the crowds would go, man, we, 
that's just weird. We can't do that. And they would just leave. I mean, look at it sometimes. Jesus would teach some things, and crowds of people would just walk away because they couldn't handle what he was teaching. It was too radical. And, and, and that must have been frustrating for Judas. Uh, there, were, there were times when G- Jesus was, it was obvious, he wasn't about raising money the way Judas probably thought he should be. He wasn't concerned about getting all the religious leaders on his side who were the most powerful people outside the Romans. And, and, and he didn't understand that. In fact, Jesus was making the religious ma- leaders matter and matter at him. And every time something like that would happen, Judas would look at Jesus and he would get more and more frustrated because Jesus was not playing by Judas' script. Jesus wasn't following his agenda. And it was starting to look like Things aren't going to turn out the way Judas had planned for them to turn out. He's not going to get anything out of it. And then finally there comes a moment in the story, and it's the final straw for Judas. And you read the story, it, 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 you read this moment, and, and for, for us it doesn't seem all that, uh, that consequential, but for Judas it was the moment, and he'd had it. He just knew this is not going to turn out what I thought. This is not going to, this is not going to be good for me. And it was enough to drive Judas to turn away from Jesus and not just turn away from him, but to turn to Jesus' enemies to get what he wanted. And that's what we're going to look at today. It's this, this story we're looking at today is actually written in two of the biographies of Jesus in the Bible. In fact, we have four biographies. If you didn't know, the first four books in the New Testament are biographies of the life of Jesus. We're going to be looking at this story that's written in the books of Matthew and John. Both of these guys wrote about this incident, um, and they write it from two different perspectives so we get different details depending on who you read so we're gonna we're gonna look at both of them we're gonna read parts from both of the accounts to get a little bit of the full story about what happened what we're gonna start is reading out of Matthew's version of this story it starts in uh, Matthew chapter 26 it says this it says meanwhile Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon a man who had previously had leprosy and while he was eating a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume and she poured it over Jesus' head. Now, we learn when we read about John's account of this, uh, this story that the perfume was worth an entire year's wages. Now, I want you to think about that. Think how expensive this bottle of perfume must have been. I mean, how much does the average person make in a year? So, so you get the idea right at the, the, right at the beginning that this is an extravagant thing that she's doing. This is an uncommon thing. This is sort of an unheard of thing. And see, most of us think about it, and we think, well, gosh, that much perfume, it must be a huge jar. It wasn't. It was actually a pretty small container. And she takes it, and she pours it over Jesus' head. And again, for us in our culture, that is really odd. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. For them in their culture, it was highly significant. This was a medicinal kind of thing. This was a very relaxing thing. It was an honoring kind of thing. It was, a, it was one of the most extremely high compliments you could give to another person. Uh, to do something like this, what she's doing for Jesus. And look at the next part. It says, And the disciples, they were indignant when they saw this. What a waste, they said. This could have been sold for a high price, and all this money could have been given to the poor. And it's hard for us to tell in the story who they're mad at, the woman for pouring the perfume on Jesus or Jesus for not stopping her. But they're mad. They're, they're, they get real angry about this. I mean, Think about how many poor people we could have fed with all the money that just got wasted in this one act, this one bottle of perfume. And then there's this, so there's this moment right here, and there's a lot of emotion. There's a lot of hurt feelings. There's a lot of confusion going on in the room. So you can imagine there's sort of a high drama moment in this story. And in John's account, we, we get even another detail about this. John tells us that it wasn't just the disciples who got mad about this. L- look at what John wrote. He says, but Judas, the disciple who would soon betray him, said, that perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and money given to the poor. And notice this little note he adds in there. Not that Judas cared for the poor. He was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. See, right here we learn something that I've already clued you in on about Judas. From day one, Judas was only concerned with his agenda. From the very beginning, Judas, he was constantly leveraging Jesus for his purposes. See, this whole deal of him following Jesus, he saw that as an opportunity to get in good with Jesus and get what he wanted. And he got himself real close to the man, the one he thought could get everything he needed. And he even got so close that he got into the bank account to make sure that he could get what he wanted. 
And Judas is thinking, come on. And is this guy, this guy's going to be king one day? He's going to set up a kingdom? <laughs> well, then I'm going to be right next to him. I'm going to be right in on it. I'm going to get as close to him as I can so that when that time finally comes, I'm going to be set. This is, that's what I'm all about. And then Jesus sees Jesus, Judas sees Jesus allowing this to happen. He watches all this money just get poured on his head and run down onto the dirty floor and thinks to himself, come on, man, I've had it. I mean, seriously? This is the guy that's going to be king? You know, this is not going to go anywhere. I mean, doing stuff like this, we're not going to get ahead doing that. I mean, how are we going to seize power and influence doing stupid things like this? I mean, I came here for something different. I am never going to get what I need to get out of this guy if he's just going to let this kind of thing go on. Look at the next verse. But Jesus, who was aware of all this, replied, Why criticize this woman for doing such a good thing to me? You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. She has poured this perfume on me to prepare my body for burial, which obviously made everybody in the room go, wait, wait, wait a minute. Burial? <laughs> what, do you, what is that about? You're, Jesus, you're, you're the king, you know? You, you can't die. You're, you're the Messiah. You're the guy we're counting on. Besides, you're not even sick, and even if you were, you've healed people. Couldn't you just fix that? I mean, you even raised a guy from the dead. If you could fix that, so why are you talking about being buried? I mean, it doesn't make sense. Why are we talking about this? And then Jesus gives us a little detail, which I think I think this is so important to the story. If, if you're skeptical about Christianity, if you're wondering if this whole Jesus thing is even true, it's verses like this that just... I love, I love this stuff, and I think it's important for you to consider. It's, Jesus says one more thing sitting around that, that table that day. He says, I tell you the truth. Wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. <laughs> I mean, think about that. Jesus says in that moment, you know, when generations have passed, and they're going to be, people all the way on the other side of the, of the, of the globe, they're going to talk about this moment right here. I mean, can you just imagine somebody, you sitting around a table tonight having dinner, and somebody just pipes up and says, you know, this is a very momentous day, and it's a momentous moment, and so I believe that in generations from now, thousands of years from now, on the other side of the planet, they're going to be talking about this moment right here. You'd probably laugh at them. But here we are, 2,000 years removed, on the other side of the planet, and we're, stalk, we're still talking about what this woman did for Jesus. I mean, if, if you're skeptical of Christianity, <laughs> you got to deal with that because what Jesus said, he was right. And regardless of what you think about Jesus, it's got to make you wonder. Next verse. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the 12 disciples, went to the leading priest, and he asked, how much will you pay me to betray Jesus to you? Because See, look, I've been trying for three years, Judas says. I've been trying. I, I'm trying to get something out of Jesus, and this is not working like I thought it was going to work. And this is really not about Jesus anyway. It's, it's about me and what I'd like to see happen. This is about what I want and what I thought that I was going to get out of this whole deal of following Jesus. And if I can't get Jesus to do what I need him to do, then I'm just going to go over to the next set of powerful people, and I'm going to get them to do what I need them to do. And, and, and I'm just going to see what, what can I get for giving up this guy. And we think to ourselves, again, we look at that story from, from our vantage point and we say, how could that happen? You know, how could you betray Jesus? How, how could someone be that close to the Son of God and, and not get it and, and turn out like that? Well, I'll tell you how. And this is so important for you to understand. This is so important for all of us to get. Whenever you come to a place in your life when your agenda starts taking precedence over God's agenda and what he wants to do, I guarantee you, you have set yourself up to betray whatever you know is right and whatever you believe in order to get what you want and because your agenda is most, most important. See, whether it becomes your morality that you're willing to compromise or a relationship that you're willing to blow up or your moral integrity, it doesn't matter. Whenever your agenda takes precedence over God's agenda, you have set yourself up to be a betrayer of God. And it won't matter anymore. And that's exactly where Judas gets. 
That's where he is right now. When there was no longer anything left in it for Judas, and he saw that it, this is not going to turn out like I want it to, he switched sides. Because, again, this wasn't, this wasn't really about Jesus all along. It was about Judas. Next verse. So they gave him 30 pieces of silver. And from that time on, Judas began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. And if you don't know the whole story of what happens next, to me, this is where it gets really amazing. Jesus knows what's happening. Jesus is not oblivious. Jesus knows what Judas has done. Ju Jesus knows what, what he's getting ready to do. He, he knows about the stealing of the money in the bank account. He knows about the betrayal. Jesus knows he's already been sold out by one of his most trusted followers. And so Judas goes out, he collects the money, and as the story goes, he comes back, and, and once he gathers together with the group again, he starts looking, and he's trying to figure out when's the best time for me to betray Jesus and turn him over, and, and, and he's just trying to figure out how to take that opportunity. And Jesus knows all of this is going on. Now, if you were Jesus, what would you have done? I know what I would have done. I would immediately, as soon as he walked back into the room, I would have said, all right, guys, let me just get your attention. There he is. There's the guy. He's about to betray us all. Let's get him. And I would have took care of it. That's what you'd have done. That's what I'd have done. The question is, what does Jesus do? Well, if you know the story, one of the very next things they do is they gather back together and they have a meal. And Jesus knows everything that's been going on. And Judas comes in and he takes his seat at the table. And Jesus takes off his garment wraps it around his waist, and he does the most humbling act of service that you could possibly do in that culture. He bends down in front of his traitor, okay, the one who's going to betray him. He takes off his nasty, dusty sandals, and he picks up his nasty, traitorous foot, and he washes the feet of Judas with the entire group. He washes all their feet. He just goes on as if nothing has happened. And then, then you keep reading the story, and, and, it, and, and, and then later they're all sitting around that table, and they're having that last meal. And remember, this is just hours before Judas is going to betray Jesus. He's going to kiss him on the cheek and betray him to his, his eventual murderers. And in the middle of this meal, Jesus speaks up. You read the story, and he, he predicts it. He tells everybody sitting around the table. He says, look, you just need to know there's, there's one of you sitting around the table right now with me, and you're going to betray me pretty soon. And all the disciples get, whoa, is it me? You know, Jesus, it couldn't be me. It can't be me, Jesus. And even Judas pipes up and says, hey, Jesus, you're not talking about me, are you? I mean, how bold is he, you know? And the story tells us that Jesus looks him right in the eye. And he doesn't stop him. He doesn't make a scene. Jesus just looks straight into the eyes of Judas. And he says, yeah, Judas, I'm talking about you. And whatever it is you're about to do, just go do it quickly. Get it over with. It's almost as if Jesus was saying, Judas, I'm not going to stop you here. I'm not going to stand in your way. Because the truth is, Judas, you thought you could bargain with me. I don't bargain. I'm not, I'm not one you can manipulate. I, I can't be bartered with. And, and I know this hasn't gone the way you wanted it to, and, and this whole thing isn't working out as you planned. You didn't get what you came here for. But Judas, you just need to know, you're not going to change the road that I'm headed down. You're not going to change me. You can't sway me. So you just go ahead and do it. Get it over with. I will not stop you. Amazing, isn't it? After that, you would think Judas would get it. He would go, wow, what have I done? Now, I don't know what Judas was thinking. The text doesn't tell us what was going on in his mind. But he continues on with his plan, and, and i got to wonder sometimes if, if Judas must have thought at that moment, boy, what a coward you are. <laughs> you know, what a weak, pathetic excuse for a king. Jesus, you're no messiah, you're no leader. I mean, you even know what I'm about to do, and you're so weak and you're so passive, you're just going to sit there and you're going to let me do this? <sighs> I can't believe I wasted three years of my life following you thinking you were going to take power. At least this way I'll get something for my time and my trouble. <laughs> at least at the end of this whole deal, I'm going to have something to show for all the time and the effort that I put into following you. I don't know if he thought that or not, but 
Here's the point. You have to understand this. The reason Jesus does nothing is because Jesus doesn't deal. He doesn't bargain. He doesn't trade. Why? Because Jesus is the king. (laughs) And kings don't barter. Kings don't bargain. Kings don't make deals. Jesus is God. And God doesn't bargain. God doesn't barter. And you can't force his hand. You can't manipulate his will. Because God is God. So the deed plays out. Judas gets to the end of it. And he finally realizes once he betrays Jesus that not only has he gotten Jesus captured, that this whole thing is about to eventually lead to Jesus' death. And Judas probably began thinking, well, now maybe finally he'll come out swinging. <laughs> now maybe finally he'll stand up for himself and, and, and do what we'd all hoped he would do, you know. He, he'll finally use all of his power and all of his influence, and he'll be forced to step up and take over. And then finally we'll see what we'd all been hoping for. But it wasn't Jesus' time yet. And Jesus wasn't that kind of a king. And Judas never could understand that. Judas didn't understand what Jesus clearly knew, that there was work to be done. And it was about more than just power and influence. And Judas realizes that not only is he he not going to get what he had hoped to get out of Jesus, that Jesus is not going to rise up, that Jesus is, 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 he's not going to take over power, and he's not going to overthrow the Romans. He's now responsible for Jesus' death. And all he has left to show for it is a sack full of blood money. And look at what happens next. When Judas, who betrayed him, realized that Jesus had been condemned to die, he was filled with remorse. He took the 30 pieces of silver back to the leading priests and the elders. I've sinned, he said. I've betrayed an innocent man. Look at their response. They go, what do we care? That's your problem. In other words, Judas, man, you made this deal. This is, this is your agenda. <laughs> This is your journey. This is what you wanted. You set it up. You carried it out. And so now that you've set it all up, you've got to deal with the consequences. This is your responsibility. And then notice, what happens next is not what you would expect, not what, we, what feels most satisfying in the drama of the whole thing. It says, Judas threw the silver coins down in the temple, and then he went out, and, and then God struck him down with lightning and paid him back for what he did. No, that didn't happen. And then Judas was killed in a tragic head-on collision with a camel. (laughs) No, no justice there. Judas went out, and what did he do? He hung himself. See, you and I would expect there to be some kind of supernatural intervention, but there wasn't. We would expect God to get his revenge and take care of things. That's not what happened. God doesn't even stoop so low in this moment to get involved in the situation with Judas. He doesn't do anything. Why not? Because, remember... You can't force God's hand. God will not be bargained with. Now I want to stop right here in the story and and just say a few things that I think it is so important for you and me to understand. This is where it applies to us. If you ever find yourself coming to God with this kind of attitude and this kind of approach where you try to deal with God or you try to make a bargain with God to get him to get on your agenda or if you think by doing something or not doing something that you can finally get God to come to your side or you can get God to do something that he's not currently doing or whatever it is that you might be wanting him to do first of all let me just say to you if you ever approach God that way number one you have a very low view of God in fact your God is pretty small see God is God, and he will not be bargained with. He will not be manipulated, and you cannot thwart his will. But here's the other thing. If you ever do, if you, if you ever say, God, I'm going to do this so that I can get you to come to my side, or, or God, I know it might not be right, but I'm going to do this anyway and because and, and y- you're going to have to come through on this deal, or God, I'm going to do this for you, but come on, you you gotta, you got to come through for me. If you ever approach God that way, if you're trying to make a deal with him, if you're trying to compromise what you know is right, or you're trying to manipulate God toward your agenda, I'm going to tell you a couple of things that you can expect to happen. Take this to the bank. Write these down if you have to. Number one, whatever you're going to do, just go out and do it and do it quickly. And the truth is, God's probably not going to stop you. He probably won't. 
And see, for those of us who've lived on the other side of that and we've watched people who we love go down this road, see, it gets real confusing for us because we want the, we want the clean ending. We want the clean consequence. We want the immediate lightning bolt kind of thing to teach them a lesson and stop them from doing whatever it is they're going to do. Like, for instance, if, if you're a parent of a teenager, you've thought this before. You've thought to yourself, okay, fine. You can go out and go to that party. You can sneak out of the house if you want to. You just go right ahead. But just know something's going to happen. You're going to get into trouble. You're going to get arrested or you're going to get into a car wreck because you're just going to have to pay the consequences for that. And so that's what happened. They, they, the teenager snuck out, and guess what? They didn't get caught, and they didn't get arrested. In fact, she came home, and she had the time of her life, and she wants to do it next weekend. <laughs> and we see that, and we think, God, what, what are you doing? You know? I mean, come on, God, there has to be some kind of consequence because God's not cooperating. Now, now, here's what I'll say. I'll say there are exceptions to all of that. There's exceptions to everything. But generally speaking, I just tell you, God doesn't deal that way. That's not God's way. If you're planning on stepping outside of God's will because you think God's not behaving for you like you think he ought to do, and you're just going to go ahead and do something, you know what God's most likely going to do for you or say in that situation? He's probably going to say to you what he said to Judas. Go ahead and do it. I won't stop you because I don't make deals, and you're not going to manipulate me. So you just go right on out and do it. So that's the first thing you need to take to the bank. Second thing is this. Whenever you step out to do whatever it is you're going to do, when you do it, just know you are now responsible for the outcome of your journey. And see, for a while, that's okay with us. You know, we're, we're okay with that. But at some point, when, when you finally do come around and say, yeah, but I didn't know that was going to happen, <laughs> or I wasn't planning on that turning out that way, I just want you to remember, just, you just need to hear the words that Judas heard. It's your problem now. That's your responsibility. Because, see, whenever we decide that, we're, that our agenda is going to take precedence over God's agenda, we, you just need to know the consequences and the responsibility for what happens next. That's on you. That's on me. Because you're on your own at that point. That's the second thing you need to take to the bank. Here's the third. Eventually, when you choose that path, you will begin to self-destruct because people who work for their own self-interest, they always self-destruct. People who work contrary to the will of God, they eventually self-destruct. Not because God strikes them down, not because they get a lightning bolt, because that's not necessary. <laughs> you don't need help destroying your life. Some of you already know that. You will eventually hang yourself, metaphorically, because that's what happens when you live contrary to the will of God. I meet people all the time, and I hear people tell me their stories, and that's their story. I didn't think God knew what he was talking about. I didn't think God could be trusted. I didn't think God was moving fast enough. So I had a better plan for my life, and I decided that I, was, I knew a lot better, and I wasn't going to do it God's way, and I was going to do it my way. And so I went out, and I did what I wanted to do, and God let me do it. God let me go, and then it backfired, and now here I sit, and I'm responsible for everything that's come because of the outcomes of that. That's the third thing to take to the bank. Fourth thing is this. At the end of the day, when all that's done and you've gone off in your agenda and you've played that out, you're going to come back. You will. You'll eventually come back. And this time, you're not going to be bargaining with God. <laughs> you're not going to be manipulating God anymore. You won't have a no another agenda to push because you won't know better than God at that point. But this time when you come to God, here's what you'll do. You'll have your hands up in the air and you'll say, God, I surrender. I didn't know what I was doing. And I, and, and I thought I could manipulate you. And now I know better. But the unfortunate part of that is this. When you come back, you'll come back with scars. You'll come back with, with busted relationships, with broken dreams, with memories that you're going to have for the rest of your life, stuff that can't ever be fixed, unfortunately. And that's really sad, but that is the truth. But when you do come back, here's the good news. God, who is your heavenly Father, he'll take you back. He will. He'll receive you scars and all because... That's the kind of God he is, too. He's not a God who necessarily erases all the consequences because, again, God's not a God you can manipulate. But he's also a God of mercy. He's a God of grace. And he will take us back, and he will point us back to a right path whenever we're ready, <laughs> whenever we're willing to stop bargaining, stop pushing our agenda, and finally 
hold our hands up and come to him and just say, I surrender. And here's the most powerful part of this whole lesson. If you miss everything else, don't miss this. If there was ever somebody in this world who had a reason to bargain with God, who had a reason to want to manipulate God's will and God's agenda, you know who it was? It was Jesus. <laughs> if you know the rest of the story, right before or right after Judas leaves the room that night and he goes out to betray Jesus, Jesus leaves the room too, but he goes to a garden and he kneels down to pray. And if you've never read what happens next, it's an amazing scene. Jesus gives us the perfect picture of the way you and I ought to approach God. See, Jesus goes into that garden and he kneels down and he begins to pray and he says, God, I see what's about to happen. I know what your agenda is. I know what you want to see happen right now. You want me to go to the cross. You want me to suffer and you want me to die. God, I don't want to do that. God, I, if there's any other way we can get this done, I am begging you, let's go with my agenda because I don't want to do this. I, I'd rather not suffer. I'd rather not go through what you're calling me to go through. God, please, if there's any other way. Jesus said that. I want to take another path, he said. But, he said, here's what I want. But at the end of the day, God, I really, I'm okay with what you choose. I, I'm surrendered to you. Not my will, but yours be done. Your path, your agenda. I'm not going to bargain with you. I'm not going to try to sell you on my agenda. I'm not going to try to manipulate you because you're God and, and I'm yours. See, you can always tell God what you want. In fact, you should tell God what you want. He wants that. He wants a relationship with you. And relationships are about honesty and trust. So I'm telling you, tell God what you want. Tell him what your agenda is. Be honest about that. But after you're done telling God what your agenda is, you approach him for who he is, a God who can't be bargained with, a God who cannot, whose will cannot be thwarted, and you come to him and you surrender and say, no more leveraging God, no more manipulating, and your, God, your path, your way is going to be my way. I trust you, and I'm surrendered to you. Today at all of our campuses, I thought it'd be great for us to just give, give us all a moment to express that to God, to, 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 to learn what it means to have a heart of surrender. We're going to sing a, an old, old song at all our campuses together here in just a minute. Some of you may already know this song, but I think the words of this song are some of the best expressions of the kind of heart we're talking about today. Someone who says, unlike Judas did, God, my agenda is not going to take precedence over yours. What I want, it's not near as important as what you want, God. See, here's the thing. That's the first step if you want to have a relationship with God. It always starts with surrender. So I'm just going to ask you, right now, bring to your mind one area of your life, one thing that, that, that you want in your life or you're just working through in your life, one area, one, one thing where your agenda and God's agenda are not in sync and you know it. You just, they're not the same. And if you have not told God this yet, I want to encourage you, by all means, go ahead and tell him what your will is, what your agenda is, what you want to see happen. And when you're done, after all of that, I want you to be able to sing the words of this song. And I want you to really mean them. Now, some of you are you're thinking, I can't do that yet. Hey, that's okay. In fact, I'd encourage you, tell God that. Just listen to the words of the song and say, God, I, I'm not there. I can't surrender th this to you yet, but I need you to help me. Would you teach me what it means to surrender? Could you help me come to that place where my agenda does not take precedence over yours, where yours is what matters? Because here's the best news about this whole thing. We talked about this last week. I've already mentioned it. Whenever you learn to do this, when you surrender your will to God, you know the great thing about that? You're no longer responsible for the outcome of your journey. God takes responsibility for all that comes of that. Because my job and your job, we're, our job is simply to be surrendered to him. We're just simply called to be obedient. Because, see, when we do, there's no greater peace than that because we're not responsible anymore. Now our life is in God's hands. So I want you to spend these next few moments as we together uh, sing this song together at all of our campuses. <laughs>